So first off, I want to thank everybody for joining our second land management focused webinar in the last two months. And we plan on doing one at least every other month. So I want to thank everyone for signing up and attending today. And especially want to thank Kevin McCoy from TC Energy for being our guest on today's webinar. And before we get started, just want to give everyone a quick 30, 40 second background on who we are at Earth, which is the company that Kevin uses to manage his uh, land uh, rights and his land payments in the system. So at Earth, we are a provider of critical infrastructure software to companies throughout North America. So we have clients, several hundred clients in the US, about 60 clients in Canada, and at least one now in Mexico. And we may have another in Mexico at this point. And by critical infrastructure, this is obviously pipeline, such as TC Energy, telecom. So most of your big telecoms use us and electric and gas utilities. And since 1995, these clients have all used us for damage prevention. So depending on where you live throughout the country or throughout Canada, we likely provide the 811 software that the telecom, the midstream oil, and the utility use in order to keep you and your community safe. And last summer, I think it was June, we acquired GeoAmps which is a land management software company. Some of you may have heard that name before, GeoAmps. And it is now bundled into Earth. And so we call this offering Earth land management. And that's what Kevin uses and has used for almost a decade now at uh, TC Energy and his former company that was acquired by TC Energy. So um, Kevin, of course, is with TC Energy and he's our guest today. And he previously has used the Earthland Management software, formerly GeoApps, when he worked for Columbia Pipeline Group, which is part of NYSource. And that company was acquired by TC Energy some time ago, and TC decided to leverage the software that they were using at Columbia Pipeline to manage all their land records. And Kevin handles the operational side of land management. So that's current lease agreements and the payments out to the landowners. And Kevin, I believe this is over 20 states. Am I correct? Correct. Okay. And what else, Kevin, do you want to say about your background or about TC Energy and kind of the business that you guys are running today? Well, for any meeting, we always like to start off with a safety moment. So um, I'll just give a quick safety moment. Uh, to think about like a lot of times when you're traveling you're away from home um, keep in mind you know there could be power outages you're not aware of and you know I think the standard is two to four hours if powers for two to four hours you know it, and your refrigerator items in the refrigerator could go bad but if you're going on vacation you don't know so a lot of times your utilities companies can you can sign up for notifications whenever there's a power outage and it, it don't notify you when it, the outage occurs and when it's restored, at least so when you go back home, you're aware and you, if you need to discard your food or not. The other option is, you know, just take a cup, fill it with water or put some ice in, in the cup. So, and then put in the freezer or, or so forth. So if power does go out and that ice starts to melt, then you can tell, by checking the cup, you can validate if there was a power outage while you were away. So it's just something to keep in mind from a, a safety perspective. I love that. I, I got food poisoning three weeks ago. Uh, so um, that's very timely, Kevin. And I didn't even know you were going to speak about food safety, but that's very timely. <clears throat> Go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, I've been with, um, I guess, in my position, more or less close to over 20 years. Um, originally uh, under NYSource, then we separated from NYSource, became Columbia Pipeline Group. And the, net, the Columbia Pipeline Group uh, was acquired by TC Energy, and now we're under TC Energy. And more or less, we have been using the land management solution. We, we started looking in 2013 because uh, um, we had an old system, I think, that was acquired in 1998. And it was, I can't remember what, it might have been, been Oracle-based, but... It, 
with all the window updates, it wasn't a solution that was going to be available to us if we had any more window updates because there's something acquired in 1998. So we need to find a solution that would need all these big system updates periodically and where you have to get Oracle database users familiar with what they need to do. We want a system that can be accessed anywhere as opposed to having to be installed on your device because that was what the system was. We wanted something that could be more robust, that can handle new projects as well as legacy items. And so that's when you know we started doing evaluation. Leadership more or less said, hey, we want a solution to handle everything. So we want so if we start a new project, we just put everything in the system, then it could be transitioned over to the operations side. And it helps save us a lot of process as opposed to project team acquiring agreements, sending it to someone else to input it into a new system because that's just duplication work because the contractors or whoever's working on that might be using one system to put the information in. And then we got to put it into our new our current system. And so that's sort of why we looked at various systems. And I think the final determination was the GeoAmp solution at that time, now Earthland Management, to, to handle that for us. So, so it sounds like what what kind of the uh, the catalyst for change was the fact that you were on that old, I think you told me before, mainframe, it could have been Oracle or, or yeah, to your point, something like that. And essentially it was into life, right? And it was not supported anymore. And so you had to make some sort of change and you were, and, and another problem you pointed out with the old system is it had to be installed, right? Kind of like in the old school world where you run an executable on your computer and you install the program and all like that. So you couldn't access it from anywhere, home field office kind of thing. Is that, did I hear that right? Correct. So uh, it was a solution that you had to have it installed on your device and your device had to be connected to the company network mm -hmm. and logged into your credentials. So, and then, it, and because it's Oracle database, it, it was just, you know, and then you, like you said, the problem with installing an application it has to be able to run on the operating system of your computer. And as companies go through and they, maybe they go through more diligent and they're on the more current system or maybe they're more behind and they're on an older system, but that, that impacts the use of such a system because it's really dependent on the operating system and installation on your device. You don't want to stay on Windows Vista any longer. <laughs> no. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. Um, one thing that that I, I I learned through talking to you about this journey starting back in 2013 when the decision was first made that hey, we gotta we gotta make a change here. We can't stay on this this system for all the reasons you just mentioned. And you started to you picked G, what it was called at the time, GeoAmps, now Earthland Management to handle all this, one of the big tasks, probably the biggest task is getting all your old data into the system. And one of the things that you told me that is really important, and if you had to do it again, is assigning an internal expert that knows your data to meet with our external experts that know data in general, right? Because that would make things a lot more efficient as a new customer. Is, is, did I hear that right? Yeah, get, getting someone who's 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 not only a subject matter as matter expert on your material, but also someone on like from Earth who can maybe explain what how the system functions and and sort of making sure the under subject matter expert understands uh, because maybe what my, I might if I'm the subject matter expert I might have one thought in my mind, but I'm not communicating well enough to earth. And so more, more being more collaborative and, 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 and challenging each other on certain things. So you can better transfer the, from the old database to the new solution. And because otherwise what we found out is maybe, because things aren't going to fit one-to-one. -one. <laughs> that was the biggest thing we discovered. Things aren't going to fit one-to-one. -one. Our old system was agreement-based the current solution, Earth Land Management, then GeoAmps, it was track based. So because of that, we had, so we're putting a, a square peg in a round hole. So more or less for some of our stuff, our newer stuff might be more track based. And so, so that makes it made the transition easier, but it was understanding that differences in how best to work around 
those differences, at least from the transitionary standpoint of what you can work with. And, and I think maybe air subject matter experts weren't, weren't expressing uh, the impact that if things got migrated to a certain area or we didn't understand the impact is just making sure that that there's a better dialogue between that subject matter expert and the uh, earth land management uh, support staff in, in, in for that migration of data. That makes a lot of sense. And one of the things that you told me was obviously maybe we, we started to kind of see this from other clients that started building things as a tract or, or parcel based first. And that was something else that you said is that if I, if I remember correctly, that when implementing the software, a best practice would be to start with the tracks and start with the GIS first. Can you talk a little bit about kind of the importance of getting that right first and then attaching anything to it, to those tracks going forward? Yeah. I mean, one thing that is, was anything with Earth or GOMF at that time, it's if, if you, as an industry or, or as a business, you should have your, your assets mapped and then, and then you should be able to have a layer and because we have a long operating history going back 100 years. So what those parcels looked like 100 years ago might not be how those properties are, are, are today because of subdivisions, acquisitions, divestures, and so forth, mergers of parcels, or whatever it may be. And then if you had that historical data already in your GIS system, then that could be translated to what it, like the Earthland Management Solution. And then that would be a great starting point because now you have the historical footprint represented and then you can add those other layers in that uh, GIS component to see how those parcels look today. You know, who are the current landowners impacted by that agreement from 100 years ago? So we're going to get to us here in a minute. We're going to get to the main meat of the conversation, which is just how the heck do you maintain 16,000 lease agreements a year? But we're on a good roll right now talking about the history. And so we talked about kind of a trend of how things were agreement based and they're tracked based now. And you also mentioned that when you have over a hundred years, in some cases, more than a hundred years of, of agreements, uh, <laughs> unless you're a wonder woman or a wonder man, most of those people have kind of passed and the, the people that now get the royalties or get the payments from these agreements are different people. And oftentimes families tend to sub, uh, subdivide over and over and over again. So can you talk a little bit about how, what was a one, at one point, a hundred acre tract may now be divided out 20 times, 20 fold since then and, and how you handle that? Yeah, um, especially where we have our leases where they acquire a large property. A lot of times, you know, when the, it was a hundred years ago, a lot of those properties were farms. And then, you know, and then over the years through development, cities expand uh, maybe areas that uh, were all farmland has now become a, a, a shopping complex or or business center or something like that and so those get subdivided into you know maybe half acre one acre lots depending on what the outcome is for the development and what that parcel of land or area would works best in that area so like for a lease um, you know we have to track we have to update payments according to who owns the lease rights, whether it's someone who owns in the fee, whether the rights, you know, maybe the mineral rights got severed, maybe the and gas owners. Well, you know, most of the data that's available electronically is only going to be surf surface ownership. If the rights were severed, a lot of times you don't have available the mineral maps <laughs> to show maybe the when the farmer sold the 100 acres, they retained the oil and gas interest, but uh, subdivided the 100 acres into 100 one acre lots you, you don't know but they retained the full mineral interest in any for anything under that 100 acres so we sort of track those requests now in the earthland management solution through a customer outreach module and so whenever we get a request for a change in ownership it gets assigned to a ticket gets assigned to a land analyst and we attach all the documentation so if that analyst isn't available someone who might get a call because landers call at any time if someone's on vacation, they can look at the ticket, see what the status is, see if it's been reviewed and so forth. And so that's how we sort of track that component of it in the system. And then of course the lease module 
is is the section that handles the payments for us and manages those payments. So we go in and update the ownership under the lease module, recalculate the payments once the transfer happens, and then now those future payments will go to whoever the new owner may be. Perfect. And so now your main task is once everything is is um, kind of in, in you know wrapped up with a bow on it, so to speak, and, and you've got all your agreements in place, can you describe what you do in, uh, in a typical month to get ready to pay the landowners that get their lease payments in a monthly basis and how you use the application to look up? Because if you've got 16,000, then odds are you're probably paying out over 1,000 per month. So can you kind of talk about what you do the month before to get ready for those upcoming payments and how the system handles that for you? Yeah. Uh, fortunately for us, most of our payments are flat rate. So, so they're, 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 they don't have escalation. They're not, we don't have to do royalty calculations. Uh, our leases define the rates to be a particular rate. And then what we do is we have about 3000 payments go out a month. Um, just because of the number of subdivisions that's happened over the years or, or heirs and so forth. And so about the middle of the month, we'll go ahead and process checks for, that are going to be due the following month. So like on February 15th, today we process payments that are going to be due from March 1st to March 31st. And there's a, a payment, uh, lease manager payment, or at least a payment option in, within the solution, Earth manage, Land Management Solution, where we can go ahead and look up payments within a particular period by the operating company because we have different operating companies and we just search okay under let's say columbia gas transmission i want to look for any pending pay projected payments from march 1st to march 31st the system then provides a listing of those items if there's any errors for example um before because we more or less create a file and as we transition those items to a file it tells us if, if there's any items that it considers an error, maybe they're missing a tax identification number, maybe, or, may, or something like that. And then we, we can correct those before we create that final file. <laughs> and in the file we create might have those 3000 line items. Then we just upload that to a, a program that gets ingested by the accounting's SAP team or system. And then that their system generates payments based on what's in, in that check file. So the, so the earth system creates the file with the check number and then that goes out through SAP, which happens to be your, your, uh, outward facing payments system. Is that correct? Correct. So, yeah. So what, because the SAP generates their own checks, the check number that we generate in our system is used is considered the invoice number in the SAP system. And that's how we can match those those payments up. So we might see it in our system, but if we're trying to find the actual payment in the SAP system, then we can find that because that check number is a reference point in the SAP system. Perfect. I wanna ask you about a neat penny feature next, but before I do that, I do wanna mention that anyone that has any questions, um, either now or uh, we'll have you know five minutes here at the end, before the bottom of the hour, you can ask them um, in the chat feature. So just feel free to chat those and we can get those addressed. So if there was anything that Kevin said that uh, you have a follow-up question for or anything that um, hasn't been talked about that you have a question, uh, feel free to ask because it's if you're thinking it, so is somebody else. Um, so Kevin, while we're on the payment feature, it's not like everyone gets an even $100 payment per month, right? Sometimes when you're splitting these things out, you have to, it's just like when you split a bill at a restaurant, somebody always has to pay a penny more than the next person, right? And then your, then your, your friend. So can you describe how the penny feature works to make sure that there's no overpayments or underpayments? Yes. Um, because um, before our, our other system, if we encounter a situation, like for example, let's say John Doe was getting paid hundred dollars a year. Now John Doe has since passed that property was conveyed to the three heirs. Well, each heir only owns 33.33333, you know, percent interest. And so the way the system is set up, you know, you put, you don't put the rental share amount they're entitled to, you put the percentage of ownership in there. So it's going to total 99.9999. So when 
the system does a payment recalculation is going to be $99.99, one cent less than what was legally defined in the agreement. So there's a feature in the Earth uh, Land Management Solution that if the um, total payout either is less than or more than the actual payment due, it gives you an error message. And then you have the option to go in and select, okay, who gets that extra penny, <laughs> more or less, because you, you want to make sure you're making a $100 payment in total, but somebody, and, it, and we had this before, you would just pick someone to get that extra penny. Um, or maybe for whatever reason, it turned out to be that when you broke the variety of percentages down and went through a multitude of people, and it turned out when you did the calculation, it was like $100 and two cents. So it's two cents over. Then you had to figure, okay, where is, so now we need to figure out who gets reduced a penny uh, or two to, to make it the $100 value. So that, and that's a feature that's allowed through the solution uh, through what we call, we just call it the penny, the penny recalculation feature or the penny feature is how we refer to it. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for explaining that for everybody. Um, so we do have a question, um, Kevin, and, and I know that you're not using royalties, but I, I can explain that. Um, but the question is this, can the software calculate payments with escalation royalties, et cetera? Have you experienced any, any of that? Uh, have you taken advantage of any of those um, parts of the software? No, uh, we haven't used that feature, at least from my perspective, because most of ours, all, from what I understand, all our payments are just to find, you know, a flat rate land rental, or you pay $400 per well, and then that's it. There, There's no royalties because we're storage. And, and so from a storage perspective, you don't, you're not producing anything. So that would require royalty payments. Sure. Sure. So I'd say at least a dozen of the, the clients that we have, and we actually have signed up a few more uh, this quarter are um, producers of solar and wind. And for them, for those clients, royalties is very important because the agreements they'll sign are based on production numbers. And so there is the ability to, um, to do a royalty calculation. And so if we use kind of the legacy names of this Earth's land management software, um, there is a program called AltAmps for alternative energy. And even clients that don't necessarily have alternative energy, that program is the one that has the specific built-in royalty capabilities. So anyone that needs to calculate royalty payments would use the, what we call, um, and I'm not on camera, but I'm doing, uh, you know, kind of like air quotes, alt amps, because it's, it's the program that's set up to help with those royalty calculations. So that's kind of like a big reason why some clients do come to us is for that specific that specific re reason. So that's a really good question. Thanks for asking that. Um, Kevin, assuming we may get one or two more questions, I want to ask about industry trends. So you have been in this industry for a while and have been using this software for almost 10 years. Things have changed a lot in 10 years. I mean, 10 years ago, I don't think anyone was doing anything from a phone out, you know, work-wise, uh, Uber had just come out. <laughs> so like we were just starting to learn to use our phones for things other than texting, calling, emailing, um, even though iPhone's been out for five years um, at that time. So from it, either from a technology standpoint or an industry standpoint, what are some of the things that you have seen change a lot, even within the last five years? I mean, one of the big ones you mentioned was going towards agreement-based I mean, sorry, going towards um, track base as opposed to agreement base. But what are some other changes you've seen either in the land industry or technology that impacts your job? Well, I think the, the biggest change has been uh, a lot of these land solutions now have a GIS component. At least uh, when I first started working, like I said, it was a separate application on your device. And it was more or less, it wasn't track based, is it's, it's tracking everything by an agreement. And, you know, that's nice from an agreement perspective, especially if you got ongoing payments, but a lot of times you encounter situations where, okay, I might have a hundred acre parcel on that parcel hundred years ago, I took a hundred acre lease, but then over times I needed different type of 
easements. Maybe I need easements for pipelines. Maybe I need a cathodic protection agreement. Maybe, maybe I need a, um, an appurtenance agreement for a gate site, gate site valve setting or something along those lines. Okay, in the old system, each one of those had a separate entry. But uh, if you had everything mapped, then you could have the map lease and uh, the lease of the map. And then as those new acquisitions happen from within beginning 100 years ago to today, you can still correlate everything and have them easily identified because now if you treat that as parcel A, then parcel A contains these agreements, lease A, easement B, you know, or B is easement, C is cathodic protection agreement, D is a valve setting easement. And then now when you, so if you're looking at it from a GIS component, you're on the GIS, so you hit that parcel and it's gonna show you all the agreements for that particular parcel. But of course, the key is for whatever company is having those agreements accurately mapped. That's something we I wish we would have done <laughs> when we were under NISORS and then Columbia now. Uh, but you know, that's legacy of a hundred years that you're trying to correct today. <laughs> so, so that would be a, a, a great uh, solution for no matter. So whoever is looking to maybe go from agreement based to track base or whatever, I recommend spending the time figuring out what it would be to map those if they're not mapped so that you can get those in the solution before activating it and using it and make it, things a lot easier. I love that you brought that up. Um, so those of you on the call that I've not yet met, uh, my whole background has been in GIS. I started at Southern Company as a GIS person for transmission, rolling out an application for tracking trees near the right of way. And then what moved me out west to Colorado was to work for Esri. So GIS is very much my heart. And anything that you do serving these industries has to have that GIS component. Because the number one question or the first question that's ever asked with a, whether it's a new construction project or a problem customer or, you know, heaven forbid, some issue of reliability is where, like the, the first question that your, your boss or VP is going to ask is where, where is this person? Where is this problem? Where are we connecting these two dots? Where are we building this pipeline? Where are we putting this well? It's very hard to answer that in an Excel spreadsheet <laughs> or without that mapping visualization. So I love that. Um, there was another question that came up that said, and it, and it, it was uh, based on something that I said, asking if, since all TAMPS was a legacy company, will it still be available? Yes. So everything that, um, when Earth bought GeoAMPS, so when we bought GeoAMPS last summer, every benefit, all the solutions will, will absolutely be available. Um, over time, you're going to see the name GeoAMPS kind of fade more into the naming. And like you see here on the screen, the blue colors, the more the Earth naming of things. And we are also making product enhancements um, to the application over time as well. That was one of the um, the appealing reasons for the founder of GeoApps to um, to join forces with the Earth was the capital that we have um, being backed by Blackstone, et cetera, to um, further enrich the the product. So yeah, we would be um, it would not be in our or our cu uh, customers' best interest to get rid of anything, especially not the ability to calculate royalties through all temps. So fantastic question. I'm glad that you asked that because it gave me a chance to clarify. So I don't think we have any other questions. Kevin, do you have any um, parting words for the audience as far as um, you know ways that you can um, impart your wisdom on, on the group this afternoon? No, I just think um, the the one thing we always liked about the system is is the customer outreach module and letting us create payments uh, through the system and so forth. And then, of course, there's a reporting tool. Um, so if you do get that solution, you you can as part of that recommend consider what reports you want. Like we have an expiration lease report, we have a, a budget forecast report, and, and and so forth like that. And we're going around reports for. A, a, a forecast payments for uh, maybe a particular asset. Maybe we'll, we have a storage field and we want to see, hey, why are all going to be all the payments, future payments in the storage field for only the storage field for the next six months? Uh, so that helps from the accounting perspective to get that to help us budget. What do we need to have budgeted? You know, luckily we're flat rate, so that's good. <laughs> but but at least that helps us 
from a budgeting perspective to get that out and plus help us identify those items that are going to be um, up for expiration. But the you know key goes back data is only what's data that's being reported is only as good as what's been entered and it goes back to we've discovered that we had stuff maybe misrepresented in our old system that got transferred over There's nothing to do with the new system it's just that you know you might want to do quality checks whenever you're transferring data just to make sure that nothing was missed or but sometimes it's just if it's wrong in the other system you're not going to know about it until until it's, until it brings itself to the forefront i love that i love that um, Kevin, I want to thank you very much for your time this afternoon and everyone that joined. If there are any questions that are lingering, you can still ask them or you can send me an email and I'll make sure that um, Kevin gets that question and we can answer it together. My email address is P, my uh, first initial of my first name, P and then Norris, my last name, at earthsolutions.com. So P Norris at earthsolutions.com. So Kevin, thank you again for your time and everyone else for joining uh, this afternoon and stay tuned for the next land-focused webinar that we'll be hosting this spring. So thank you, everybody. We appreciate you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Kevin.